Welcome again to The Elephant Podcast. I'm Kevin Canners. I think all of us who have even a slight concern about climate change have by now encountered people, often ones who are related to, who passionately dispute the reality of the problem. Actually, the globe isn't warming, they tell us. Or if it is, humans aren't to blame. And even if you can get them to concede these first two points, it turns out climate change isn't really a problem. We'll adapt, they say. Even if you're somehow not personally close with someone who has a stance, anytime you read an article on climate change online, regardless of the publication, it's one you encounter. At least if you scroll down to the comment section, where you'll see a league of people confidently proclaiming climate change is a hoax. Skeptics or deniers might not be a majority of the public, but there's certainly a loud and outspoken sector of society. Maybe you've caught yourself wondering, where is this all coming from? How is it that so many people vehemently believe in an alternative view of reality when the overwhelming majority of scientists agree about all the main facts of climate change? That it's here, it's human-caused, and it's a reason for great concern. Well, it turns out these doubts about the reality of climate change have largely been driven and seeded in society thanks to the deliberate work of a few key people. That's a story that Harvard professor and science historian Naomi Oreskes explores in her book, which she co-wrote with Eric Conway, Merchants of Doubt, How a Handful of Scientists Obscured the Truth on Issues from Tobacco Smoke to Global Warming. Her curiosity into this area was piqued when she began looking into the scientific literature on climate change in 2004. Given the fractious nature of the public debate about climate change, Naomi also expected there to be a lively scientific debate about climate change. But when she actually read the peer-reviewed literature, to her surprise, she found that there virtually was none at all. Not about the fundamentals, that is. Yes, there was a debate about all the details, but in terms of the main facts, that humans are causing climate change and that it's a problem, there was widespread agreement. She wondered then, why was the general public of such a different view than the scientists? She started investigating further. And what she found is that the cause of this doubt landed at the feet of a surprisingly few high-level Cold War scientists who spread doubt about climate change by leaning on their privilege, power, and connections. And this small group of men, people such as Frederick Zeitz, Fred Singer, and Robert Jastrow, just happened to be the same loose-knit group who had cast doubt on other scientific health and environmental concerns of recent times, in things like acid rain, the hole in the ozone layer, and the harms of smoking tobacco. In each case, their basic strategy was to keep the controversy alive by spreading doubt and confusion long after the scientific consensus had been reached. Merchants of Doubt was adopted into a documentary film, which was released last year, directed by Food Inc.'s Rob Kenner. I reached Naomi Oreskes by Skype. Naomi Oreskes, welcome to The Elephant. Thanks. Nice to be here with you. We're here talking about your book, Merchants of Doubt, where you look into the story behind how a few select people have been able to spread doubt about human-caused climate change. And I I want to start off by just asking you how you got interested in the subject. I'm a historian of science. What I work on primarily is the question of how scientists decide that we know something, how they evaluate evidence, how they decide if there's enough evidence to say that something is established scientifically, how they reach consensus, and also how they decide what topics are important to work on and how they obtain funding for those topics. So uh, more than a dozen years ago, I was working on a book on the history of oceanography. I was actually almost done with the book. And the last chapter of the book was going to be about how a group of Cold War oceanographers transitioned from working on ocean acoustic surveillance and missile delivery and other issues related to the Cold War to being focused more on environmental issues. And in the process of writing that final chapter of the book, a book by the way, which I'm finally finishing now after a long detour, I came across the work of a group of scientists who back in the 1950s, at the time of the International Geophysical Year, had said in no uncertain terms that burning fossil fuels puts carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And there was this possibility that that could change the climate. And they thought that was really important, both scientifically for understanding climate dynamics, but also politically and socially, because it could lead to sea level rise and a host of other things which, with which we're now quite familiar. So I was reading these materials from the 1950s, so more than half a century ago, and I was just frankly blown away by the level of discussion, the interest in the issue, and the seriousness with which this group of scientists were taking the question. And so I started digging more deeply into that and realized that the science was much older 
much deeper and much more well established than most people realized. And that caught you by surprise at the time? Was I surprised? Yeah, well, I was in a way because I'm a professional historian of science. So if anyone should have known this, it might have been me. And I thought, well, if I didn't know this, then obviously most other people don't know it either. And so then I started paying more attention to the whole uh, debate about climate change. And what I came to realize very quickly was that actually in the scientific community, there was no debate. That is to say, there was no debate about the reality of climate change. So I wrote a paper in 2004 that said that, and immediately I became the target of attacks. And it was those attacks, it was me actually becoming a victim of the merchants of doubt, which led me to, to try to figure out, well, well, who are these people? Who are the people? Why are they attacking me? Why are they, claim, why are they claiming there's no consensus? You know, what is this all about? And it was that set of questions based on my own, you know, being attacked by these people that then led to the book and now the film Merchants of Doubt. So I want to get into what you actually discovered in that journey you went on. But what, what was the, the nature of those initial attacks against you? That I was a Stalinist, that I was a communist, that I was attempting to suppress scientific debate, uh, that I was part of a liberal conspiracy to bring down global capitalism. All very strange uh, things for a historian <laughs> of science to be accused of. And the very tenor of the attacks, it was very hostile, very angry. Um, the tenor of the attacks and also the obvious red baiting quality of it made it pretty clear that there was something going on that had really nothing, if anything, to do with the science. And so what were your first steps? So you, you're getting attacked, you, you realize there's, there's something curious going on here. What do you do from there? Well, I mean, it wasn't really first steps because that makes it sound more organized than it really was. I mean, two things happened. So one was that um, I, I wrote something for Science Magazine in which I sort of just kind of hinted at the early results that we were, some of the things I was finding that some of the people who were attacking me had previously worked for the tobacco industry and had defended the tobacco industry against the scientific evidence of the harms of tobacco. I thought that was a pretty significant finding. So I wrote something for Science Magazine in which I mentioned that. And Science Magazine then started getting attacked. Uh, and one of the people who we ended up writing about, Fred Singer, wrote a letter to the editor saying that what I was writing was nonsense and threatening to sue Science Magazine if they didn't let him write a rebuttal. Now, in, in actual point of fact, I had said nothing about Fred Singer, and no one has any legal or moral right necessarily to defend other people. I mean, you can if you want to try, but there's no legal obligation on the part of any journal to let Fred Singer defend anybody else. And for a variety of other reasons, the magazine didn't publish his letter. But what happened was that the editor came back to me saying, you know, we need more documentation of what you're talking about. So I wrote a memo that turned into a 17-page memo with, you know, chapter and verse references, citations, all the evidence about where this information was coming from. And when I had finished writing that memo, two things happened. I got a phone call from Don Kennedy uh, thanking me and wanting to talk more about what I had learned. And I also realized that I had written the seeds of what you know, ultimately became a book chapter. So I realized there was a story in this. And around the same time, I w went to a conference on the history of meteorology, a conference who one of the people in the audience there was Eric Conway, who at the time I did not know. And in the Q&A, in the question and answer session, this issue came up. And afterwards, over a beer, Eric came up to me and he said, well, Naomi, you know, some of the people who are attacking you are the same people who attacked Sherry Rowland over the scientific evidence of the ozone hole. And I thought, what? Really? The same people who attacked a Nobel laureate, one of the greatest scientists of the 20th century, uh, you know, the man who pretty much saved us from disaster in the case of ozone depletion, that I'm being attacked. You know, my name is being used in the same sentence as Sherry Rowland. So I thought that was pretty like weird, but also kind of flattering in a way. <laughs> and so Eric said, yeah, I've got a bunch of stuff I'll send you when we get home, because this conference was in Germany. So a week or so later, Eric sent me a pile of documents, and they showed very, very clearly that what he said was true, that it was the exact same people. And very quickly we realized the same people had attacked me, had attacked Sherry Rowland, and had defended the tobacco industry. And so that's when Eric and I started talking and, and began to think there was a story here to be told about a group of people who really were kind of serial contrarians um, who had systematically attacked science and scientists, and now in this case historians of science, over evidence that documented a real serious threatening harm like ozone depletion or the harms of tobacco or climate change. And these are the people who we ultimately came to call the merchants of doubt. 
so you mentioned Fred Singer. Can you give us a, an idea? Like, who, who are the, the rest of these people? Well, the key finding that we present in the book was that the story begins with a rel- relatively small group of people, a handful of scientists who all have very similar personal biographies. They're all physicists. They all became prominent, successful, and well-known during the Cold War. And they all worked on Cold War weapons, rocketry, and satellite projects on behalf of you know, containing communism, defending the United States, and rose to positions of quite significant power and influence within the American scientific community. So these people, they were all cold warriors, but all very, very anti-communist. They all had a very strong, I would say, both political and personal commitment to the concept of containing communism. And what we discovered, the sort of, you know, that part of the story wasn't really surprising. I mean, we all kind of know about the role of physicists in the Cold War. But what was surprising was this discovery that when the Cold War ended, instead of being happy and retiring, because by this point most of these men were quite senior, you know, in their 70s or or older, instead of being happy that the West had won the the Cold War, instead they were like generals who can't stop fighting. And so they looked for a new enemy. And the new enemy that they found was environmentalism because they basically believed that environmentalists were watermelons, green on the outside, but red on the inside, that this was a kind of slippery slope to socialism, a backdoor to communism through the means of government regulation of the marketplace. And what we started discovering was they had written numerous letters, articles, various things where they had actually made this argument. If you allow the government to control the marketplace and say ban tobacco, or if you allow the government to ban the chemicals that cause ozone depletion, or if you allow the government to intervene and control carbon emissions, this is a step in the direction of centralized planning of the economy. And actually, of all the people, Fred Singer, the one I mentioned, is the one who said this most explicitly in in the most, you know, the most times, the most different places. But you see it either said explicitly or suggested in the writing of all these other people as well. So they're very, very hostile to environmentalism. And so they began to attack the scientific evidence that demonstrated the harms of environmental damage like ozone depletion or climate change or the harms of the public health harms of something like tobacco. One thing you you point out that I I found really telling is that, you know, as a historian, they almost, they tell you the answer of why they're against it. You know, instead of having discussions about the science, what they're talking about instead in their own uh, correspondence is often uh, the implications of, of what would happen if this was true. Exactly. And so we we like the phrase implicatory denial. They're in denial because they don't like the implications. Because if climate change is true, and we say this in our book, and Naomi Klein has picked up on this idea very strongly in her recent book, This Changes Everything. If climate change is real, then this is the greatest market failure ever seen. That's what Nicholas Stern has said, the you know former chief economist of the World Bank, not exactly a communist. So this is a colossal market failure because energy is at the root of all economic activity. And it means that we have to find some way of controlling carbon emissions. And how do we do that without controlling the marketplace? Now, I don't necessarily take the view that Naomi Klein does, that this is does mean the end of capitalism. But the irony of this story is that actually her conclusion is the same as theirs. So in this case, the far left and the far right come together in the same spot. Both of them conclude that this this means the end of capitalism. For Naomi Klein, that's a good thing. But for the merchants of doubt, that was a bad thing. And so... The difference, of course, is that for Naomi Klein, she doesn't deny climate change. She says, yes, it's real and we have to fix capitalism or do something different. But the merchants of doubt say capitalism is the greatest system ever invented. Our political, economic and religious freedom is tied to capitalism. Without capitalism, we have no freedom. This is kind of the key intellectual move they make. Therefore, we cannot accept any threat to capitalism. Therefore, we don't believe the scientific evidence. We don't believe these people and we will fight it and we will deny it. And that's the kind of key move that's intellectually, I would say, illegitimate, right? Because you could not like the implications of something, but still recognize that it's true and you need to act on it. I mean, if you discover that your husband is cheating on you, the best solution is not to pretend that it's not happening, but to confront and figure out, can this be fixed? Can you discuss it with your husband? Or maybe your marriage has failed, right? I mean, these are things that we come to grips with all the time in ordinary life. And we all know that if you deny the problem, it doesn't make it go away. So, but, so instead of acknowledging that this was a real problem and trying to think through what would be the remedies, are there ways to reform capitalism, are there market-based mechanisms? And of course, some people did do that. Many people did do that, said, well, look, we could fix this with a carbon tax. That's what Al Gore said. We could fix this 
with an emissions trading system. That's what my colleague Robert Stevens at the Kennedy School says. So many sensible people said, okay, we do have a problem, but we think we can fix it. But what the emergence of doubt did was to deny the existence of a problem at all. So how, how did a group of, you know, just a small handful of men manage to have so much influence? Well, you know, it's a very interesting question. And of course, one of the things I find interesting about that question is that, particularly in the United States, none of us have trouble believing that a few great men can do great things, or even one great man, like, you know, Abraham Lincoln. So we, we very much believe in the power of individuals when it comes to doing good things, but we're much more re resistant to believing in the power of individuals when it comes to doing bad things. So the first thing I wanted to say is, small numbers of individuals can do tremendous damage if they set their minds to it, and if they're influential and powerful and have money. And so that's what this story is really about. So you begin with a group of people who are very influential because of what they did in their Cold War. They have the ear of senators and congressmen and generals and admirals and heads of corporations and foundations, and they use that. And they, so they exploit a set of contacts they have, also media contacts, they have a lot of contacts with the media. One of the key people in our story is Robert Jastrow, an astrophysicist who um, was very active in the early years of the U.S. space program and appeared on television many times explaining the Apollo missions. So he, he was a bit of a celebrity. He had also written a number of popular books, very successful popular books. So he had lots and lots of media contacts. So these men exploit their media contacts and they exploit their political contacts. They get on television. They get into the pages of the Wall Street Journal. They get quoted in the New York Times. And they get invited to the White House. There's one particular episode we talk about where they actually get invited to the administration of George H.W. Bush to brief them on climate change. And ha this clearly has an impact on Bush administration. So they have influence because of who they are. But in addition, the other key part of the story, of course, is money. So what happens in the, early, in the late 1980s when the story begins, it's really not about money for these men. It is really about politics and their own vision of what how they think they're defending freedom. But very quickly that changes. By the early 1990s, the fossil fuel in industry has realized that they're potentially in trouble. And the fossil fuel industry reacts very, very strongly to the Rio summit in 1992, and then begins a very strong campaign to fight the Kyoto Protocol to the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. And so they organize the Global Climate Coalition, but they also begin to give money to a whole set of think tanks that are supposedly independent but in fact are now funding fossil fuel money. And one of these key think tanks is the George C. Marshall Institute, which is the focus of our book and which is where these particular emergence of doubt got started. So by the mid-1990s, you see a whole network of think tanks, including but not limited to the Marshall Institute, but includes the Cato Institute, the American Enterprise Institute, the Competitive Enterprise Institute. And what they all have in common is that they all promote free market uh, economic policies, the idea of free enterprise being a kind of foundation stone of the American way of life. And nearly all of them, as far as we are able to document, are also receiving money from the fossil fuel industry. Can you tell me about the connection to the, the tobacco industry fight and what they learned, these, these merchants of doubt, from that, that fight to sow doubt about tobacco causing cancer? The tobacco connection is key on two levels. One, it's key because it tells us that this is not a principled scientific debate, that this is part of a pattern of defending damaging products and activities. So that's, that's kind of key intellectually. But in terms of the actual practices, the strategies and tactics, what we were able to show in our book was that what these men did was to actually take the strategy and tactics that had been developed by the tobacco industry and apply it directly to the climate change debate. And so we demonstrated two things. First of all, many of the kinds of claims they make are virtually identical. There are sentences you could take directly out of the debate on tobacco control where the tobacco industry says, well, the science regarding tobacco is not settled. There's no consensus about the harms of tobacco. So just replace the word climate change, uh, you know, replace the word tobacco with climate change, and now you have the playbook for climate change denial. So it's exactly the same pattern. But in addition, it's also some of the same people. So some of the key people that we studied, we were able to show, to demonstrate that they had also worked for or with the tobacco industry. So one of the key uh, players there is Frederick Seitz. He was the original chairman of the board of the Marshall Institute. He was a very prominent physicist. He was president of the U.S. National Academy of Sciences in the early 1960s. But later in life, he took a very, he was always very conservative politically, but later in life, he took a very hardcore right-wing pro-business anti-regulation 
stance, and he began to work for the tobacco industry. And from 1979 to 1985, he ran a program for the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Corporation, whose purpose was to fund scientists to do distracting research. And what we mean by that is to do scientific research, it really was research, but the purpose of it was not to actually better understand the harms of tobacco. The purpose was to distract attention from the harms of tobacco and focus on other things. So for example, he funded research on the risks associated with asbestos exposure. So that if you had a, a court case in which someone had lung cancer, which they were claiming was due to their smoking, the industry defense would say, well, have you ever been is, is, exposed to asbestos? And in some cases, these people had. And then they would bring an expert on the stand to say, well, asbestos also causes lung cancer. So therefore, there's no way to know whether or not this man's lung cancer was caused by asbestos or cigarette smoking. And they would do the same thing with radon. And they would do things like that with stress, the relation of heart disease to stress. And one of the ironies is that some of the research they funded was actually rather interesting. I mean, the relationship of heart disease to stress is an interesting problem. They also funded research on prions. So they created a network of friendly scientists, scientists who were indebted to them, scientists who were grateful to them, who would be willing to appear in court in order to raise doubt, reasonable doubt, in court about the harms of tobacco. And so they wrote, at one point, there's a very famous memo that was written where one tobacco industry executive says, doubt is our product because it's the best way to compete with the body of fact. And that is kind of in a nutshell what this strategy is all about. And so that's why that became our title, Merchants of Doubt. If you can create doubt in people's minds about the problem, then people are not receptive to spending money or making an effort or changing their lifestyle um, to fix a problem that you know, might not actually even exist. And of course, some of their ad campaigns said explicitly that. There was one climate change campaign in the 90s that explicitly ran the slogan, how much are you willing to pay to solve a problem that might not even exist? And, and I, there's another quote that says, you know, don't lie, you don't need to. Exactly. Don't lie, you don't have to. I love that memo. And that's exactly right. I mean, this is the, the sort of evil genius of the whole thing. You don't have to lie. You just have to cast doubt. Because if you can persuade people that we don't really know, then people will say, oh, okay, well, we don't really know. We should just let scientists do more research. And so it's a very effective delaying tactic. And of course, many people, even evil people, are still uncomfortable lying. And many of us, I think, have very sensitive lie detector you know, sensors. I think many of us can tell when people are giving us the runaround or, as John Stewart said, memory the other night, you know, if it <laughs> smells bad, it probably is bad. Right? <laughs> but, but if you're not lying, if you just say, well, you know, there's a lot we don't know about tobacco. There's a lot we don't know about the mechanisms of uh, cancer development. There's a lot we don't know about atmospheric dynamics. All of, these fa all of these statements are true. And they're particularly effective if you then get a scientist in a debate, because this is another part of the strategy. Get a scientist to debate you on television or on the radio. And if I work for the fossil fuel industry, I say, well, there's a lot we don't know about atmospheric dynamics. And then the scientist says, that's true. But, and then he goes on into some complicated explanation of how he thinks we really do know there's global warming. But the basic idea that we don't know a lot has now been planted and the scientist has agreed with it. So the person in the audience hears the scientist say, oh, there's a lot we don't know. And for many people, that's what they walk away with. They walk away with that impression of confusion, of doubt, of uncertainty. And therefore the idea that, yes, we know the climate is changing. And yes, we know it's caused by human activity. And yes, we've known this for a long time. That message does not come across clearly. Yeah, and and even even more to the point, it seems that by even having the debate, they've already won in a way, right? By by taking up half the screen and putting it in the frame that there is a debate to be had, it seems like that would be enough. Exactly, and that's one of the points we bring out very strongly in the film, where we actually have visuals where we show how this works, you know, visually. As you said, the screen is fifty fifty. So even if you heard no words. The impression you would be give, get just by seeing the screen, you know, in a hotel lobby, in an airport would be, oh, there's a debate about climate change. And the caption below, you know, the Fox News caption will say debate about climate change. So you, the viewer, sees debate about climate change. So this is one reason why I and others have really stressed in the scientific community that scientists should never debate climate change deniers, that the minute you even agree to that framework, you've lost. Yeah. I mean, another point you you make that I, I think is a, a really interesting one is that whenever anyone's creating doubt about climate change or, or any of the other problems, to be frank, it, they're telling a story that we want to hear. It's more comfortable 
to have the idea in our heads, well, maybe there isn't a problem, maybe we don't have to change. Can you just talk about the role that that comfort, the, the psychological comfort plays in um, the ability for them to, to be so successful in spreading this message? Yes, I think that's, I think that's right. And at the end of Merchants of Doubt, we, we essentially say that because the end of the book is a place where you can say things you believe are true but can't prove. <laughs> so I'm not a psychologist, and I can't prove that one of the reasons this works is because it is a comforting message. But I think all of us intuitively know that that's true, that, you know, there's a, I mean, I think the whole term an inconvenient truth is a very, it's a very brilliant phrase because that's what this is about. These are about truths that are more than inconvenient. They're unsettling. There's a wonderful cartoon I saw one time of people lined up at two movie theaters. One movie is showing an inconvenient truth. The other is showing reassuring lies. <laughs> and all the people are flocking to go see the reassuring lies, right? So we all want to be reassured. And as you said, we, many of us like the way we live. We don't necessarily want to change it. Change is take, makes an effort. Even if in the long run the change would be better for us, we might actually be happier or healthier. But, I mean, lots of studies do show that, that people experience change as a threat they worry that change means loss. So, and anyone who's ever run an organization has had this experience. I mean, I had this experience when I was a university administrator. It's very hard to persuade people of the value of change, even if in the long run it will make things better. So if you can tell people, oh, everything's fine. You don't have to change. You don't have to worry. Just go on doing what you're doing. You know, most people would prefer to hear that message. It's only a very small handful of people who, you know, you know want to think, oh, God, the world's a wreck. We have to fix it kind of thing. So, so I think that is part of why this works. And, and as we said at the end of the book, I mean, we would like climate change not to be real. You know, climate change is a bad news story. It's a very, very bad news story on many levels. I think the recent Papal encyclical, you know, brings out a whole additional set of ways and means in which climate change is a bad news story in terms of morality and justice. You know, things that scientists haven't really talked about that much because it's outside of their domain. So this is a very serious bad news story. And nobody likes bad news. So it's much easier either just to ignore it or to blame the messenger and say, oh, well, those people, they're just some part of some liberal conspiracy or they're liberal alarmists or they're hysterical females. So so if these people had been on the wrong side of so many different debates, whether it's tobacco or uh, the ozone layer or acid rain, why did they still have any credibility? Is it just because no one bothered to to connect the dots of, of their previous arguments? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've often asked myself that question. I think that's right. And Eric Conley and I have talked about this a lot. I think we feel like the most important contribution we've made here is connecting the dots. Because when you just see one of these in isolation, you might think, well, you know, how do we really know that CFCs are depleting stratospheric ozone? Or how do we really know for sure whether or not smoking is hazardous? You know, my aunt Mildred smoked two packs a day and lived to be 90, right? Lots of people have um, counterexamples like that. But when you connect the dots, when you see the pattern, when you see it's the same story over and over again and the same people in some cases, then you realize, okay, this is not about the science. And you know, the best example of this I think we have right now is the New York Times recently reported that the Coca-Cola company is now funding scientists to argue that you know, it's fine to drink Coke because the science regarding diet is unsettled and in fact, as long as you exercise, you know, you can eat whatever you want. That's a slightly crude version of what they're saying, but that's the basic message. Now, that flies in the face of huge amounts of scientific evidence that proves it's very difficult to lose weight through exercise alone. Um, and even if you could exercise seven or eight hours a day, which almost nobody has time for, you still need to eat healthy and nutritious food. And something like Coca-Cola is just completely empty calories. There's no way that Coca-Cola is good for you. I mean, you might it might not be, I mean, it's just not good for you, right? So, and reading this article, you know, it's the same thing over and over again. The science isn't settled. We have a debate. Experts disagree. They're funding scientists for hire who are making their case. Um, and in the article that the New York Times wrote about it, they actually quote someone saying, well, these guys are, are essentially merchants of doubt. And I thought, oh, well, that's kind of nice that our language is now, we've now named this thing. This thing is a real phenomenon. It exists and we've given it a name. And that we didn't have the name for it before. And when you have a name, it makes it a lot easier to talk about something because now you don't have to have the whole 40-minute podcast all over again. You could say, oh, here's another example. Look at this. They're selling doubt. Here we go again. Now, all three of the, the main characters that you mentioned in the book, Robert Jastrow, William Nirenberg, and, and Frederick Seitz, they, they've passed on. But 
you you just mentioned like Coca Cola or these other companies will recruit new new players, new scientists to help promote their message. Do we know anything about the process of, of how they find people who are open to their arguments? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I think it's different in different cases, but we do know a little bit about it. I've, I've received lots and lots of emails from people who have told me stories about how people try to recruit them. So one of the things that we know happens is that um, industry or think tanks will send people to scientific meetings. And if someone gives a, a talk at a scientific meeting that suggests that maybe they're a little bit skeptical of the mainstream view, maybe they work in an area that's legitimate but could be used as a kind of distraction, um, these people will be approached. So we know that in the case of tobacco, the tobacco, tobacco industry was very, very vigilant about keeping track of what was going on in the scientific community. And if they got wind of somebody who, was, who say, was saying, there was a famous case involving a scientist, a very prominent scientist who worked on asbestos, who believed honestly, I think, legitimately, that many of the cancers that were being blamed on tobacco were actually caused by asbestos. So the tobacco industry approached him, recruited him, started promoting his work, started paying him, started sending him to conferences. So it's about finding people who, for one reason or another, might be receptive, either because they legitimately have a view that could be useful to the industry, or maybe they're receptive because they're lonely. I mean, I've certainly seen this. Scientists who are sort of lonely, isolated, who feel that their work hasn't got the attention that they think it deserves. So the industry is always on the lookout for people like this. And if a person gives a talk in a national meeting where they suggest that, you know, they feel their work hasn't got the attention it, it deserves, like they work on some aspect of climate change that says, well, you know, maybe instead of working on greenhouse gas emissions, they work on, you know, soil management practices or something. The industry will go up to those people after they've given their talk and they'll say, well, w would you be interested in coming to a conference you know, my think tank is organizing a conference on the diverse causes of climate change. And often they'll present it as a legitimate scientific meeting. And this person might say, oh, well, I work on the diverse causes of climate change. And then they get sort of drawn into the orbit. And then the next thing you know, they might be being invited. Well, would you be willing to go on Fox News and have a debate? And again, you can see how this begins to work. So let's say this person does work on soil management practices. And that's legitimate because that's a real thing. But now they go on TV and some scientists are saying, you know, most of climate change is being driven by greenhouse gas emissions from burning fossil fuels. And he says, well, but my research shows that we've really neglected this issue of soil management practices. And again, he's not lying. He's telling the truth. Maybe we really have neglected that, but it's kind of a sideshow. But the public who's listening doesn't really get that. And what they don't understand is, yeah, it's true. Soil management practices are relevant and we probably should pay some attention to that. But it's still not the main driver of climate change. What about the internet's role in all this? I, I've heard you mention that, that that has played a role, you think, in, in allowing these lies and, and misinformation to propagate. Yeah, well, again, I'm not an expert on in the internet, but I think it's pretty obvious to anyone who's Googled climate change that one of the things the internet has done is it's made all these contrarian arguments much easier to get hold of. So I get email all the time from someone who will tell me I'm wrong. Again, just today I got one of these. I'm wrong because there is no climate change. And then they'll give me a set of bullet points. And often they're verbatim the same as other emails I've received the day before, the week before, the month before, the year before, because they're pulling these things off the internet. And so it's very easy now for confirmation bias to really dominate people's media landscape. You can go to the internet and if you're a climate change skeptic, it's extremely easy now to find um, websites that will reinforce your skeptical views. And that would not have been true, say, 40 years ago, when if you wanted scientific information, you know, you either had to go to the Encyclopedia Britannica or, you know, you had to, you know, get a pamphlet from the U.S. Weather Service or something. So the sort of ease of access to information has also become ease of access to disinformation. I mean, I, I read a short article that you had uh, maybe online, uh, or I don't know if it's in the print version, but uh, in the New York Times about uh, the case for divestment. And I looked down to the comments and the, the very first one was was exactly what you're describing, like saying there has been no warming. Uh, why won't you like answer this question? Uh, is it frustrating for you as a scientist to to be confronted constantly with this sort of alternative universe where, where sort of facts don't don't matter? Um, yeah, well, of course. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting you cited that example because I, I read that one as well. Um, and of course, you know, this is a classic disinformation scheme because the scientific evidence is clear that the warming has not stopped. 
there's no pause, there's no hiatus. And yet that has been so pushed in the last few years by the forces of denial that it's now out there in the mainstream, very hard to um, refute. And again, someone says there's no warming, you say, well, actually, that's not true. It's a statistical artifact. It's a misrepresentation based on cherry picking the data, you know, all basic classical tricks that these guys have been using for years. But again, very hard to make that argument. So is it frustrating? Well, of course. Um, you know, I, you know, my feeling about all of this has evolved. In the beginning, it was just weird, right? In the beginning, I thought, where is this stuff coming from, right? So in the beginning, it was actually motivating to try to understand it. And then I got angry because I began to realize how much damage the merchants of doubt had done because the person who's writing that comment, the person who's writing that comment might be a merchant of doubt. They may actually be a paid troll of some industry group because we know that happens as well. But they also might be an honest, ordinary citizen who has been misled by the merchants of doubt. So, so now I feel that this is just proof of the damage that's been done. It's proof that this really matters because now we see the way in which it's influenced public opinion and how we have people reading the New York Times, which we would normally think would be relatively educated people, who have now been completely persuaded by a totally false claim. Well, it's a, a fascinating, if at times, a frustrating story that, that you've told both in the, the book and the film. It's uh, one I, I highly recommend. Naomi Oreski, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. It's nice speaking with you. Thanks for your work. That was my conversation with professor and historian of science, Naomi Oreskes. She's the author, along with Eric Conway, of the book Merchants of Doubt.